We have like if it's sorry for the delay. So today we have uh, Dr. Diamond Borden, who's visiting from the Flatiron Institute. Um, Audrey was a grad student at Stockholm University, working with uh, Jon Gunmanson on the Spider Balloon Project. Um, then uh, was a postdoc at Princeton, working on the Atacama Cosmology Telescope and Simon Observatory is now a fellow at the Flatiron Institute, continuing to work on both uh, CMB projects. And, uh, and we'll be starting in the fall at the Max Planck Institute as a fellow there. Um, he's an expert on uh, cosmological data analysis for, from CMB experiments, um, doing the nitty gritty uh, dirty work with the data, and also on these, uh, these uh, non-linear, non-Gaussian, uh, non on Gaussianities in the CMB data, which is uh, constrained for uh, another way we can constrain uh, inflation through this uh, FNL parameter. So he's uh, written a number of papers on this and is sort of an expert in the field on that as well. So uh, without further ado, further ado, we'll hear from Audrey. Thank you, Max. Um, yeah, so, okay, I'll just uh, ask to uh, give an overview of what the at the Karma Cosmology Telescope and the Simons Observatory uh, are looking at. Um, so, so I'll do that. Uh, um, but I'll do that by starting to give some context on the cosmic migrant background field. So here you see um, the data from the Planck satellite, which is really where most of our current knowledge about cosmology comes from, I would say, especially in the field of the of the C and um, So uh, this is the, the CMB as observed by Planck, this, this satellite depicted here. Um, you can see all the temperature anisotropies. Uh, Planck also observed the uh, polarization of the CIB. So that's depicted here as these um, headless vectors on top of a smooth version of the temperature map. Um, and, and this is really wonderful data, but of course we want to, want to learn more. Um, and just to give you a rough idea of what you're, what you're looking at here, um, so the cosmic background gives, um, gives you a measurement of the photon baryon plasma at recombination, so at redshift of something like 1100. And um, in basic terms, you can think of these temperature anisotropies giving you a, a snapshot of the density of the plasma. And then the polarization giving you something of an idea of the velocity of the plasma. So these two observations are very complementary, actually. They're sort of out of phase. So they're, it's very useful to measure both of them. Um, so oftentimes we compress these maps into uh, power spectra. And most of the cosmology is, is contained in these power spectra, although there's also extensions to that that I'll, I'll go, go into. Um, to read these power spectra, right, it's uh, a function of multiple, which you can just think of as wave number. Uh, you can also look at the top here uh, at angular scales. So the the largest angular scales are here on the on the left for you, and then the the smallest are in on the right. Um, this is a compilation of of recent measurements. Um, at the top, you see the power spectrum of this temperature map. And then uh, these bottom two power spectra are, are two power spectra you can extract from the um, polarization. The polarization is always expressed into two fields, in this case, E and D. I mean, you see several experiments, uh, but you can focus now on the light blue points, which are these uh, measurements from Planck. And uh, if you look at this, there's, there's really two regions where, where we can hope to improve still over Planck. Um, one of them is right here at the very largest scales in uh, the polarization. Um, and for example, this was what this spider experiment that, that Max mentioned was, was looking at. Um, however, in this talk, I will not talk about this, this stuff. I will talk about the other thing we're trying to do, which is all the way at the smallest scales, um, measuring the, the CMB there. Um, Okay, so Planck. Oh, yeah. Also, I'm sorry. For all steps. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, so the, the, the points here from ACT are sort of older ACT data points, but they're noisier. Um, 
and also they don't span the whole sky like Planck did. So you, you sort of add some noise by not seeing the whole sky. Right, but then the small scale, so, so then you don't have small scale data. Uh, at, the, at the time, no, we did oh. not publish any small oh, okay. scale data. No, that's right. That's right. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, okay, so the Planck satellite um, uh, had a 1.5 uh, meter diameter primary mirror. So that sort of limits the resolution you can look at. So the way to go forward is to just build a bigger mirror, basically. So um, uh, these two experiments that I'll talk about are both ground-based telescopes, so you can build a relatively large mirror. So the Apicama cosmology telescope or ACT has a six meter primary, and this Simons Observatory telescope also has a six meter primary. So you can, you can really extract more uh, from the CMD just by having better resolution. Um, the other thing to, to point out perhaps is that uh, in, in this field of, of CMD observations, um, uh, the detector technology is, is quite mature and it's, it's relatively difficult to, to get a, make a single detector more sensitive. <clears throat> so really the name of the game is to just build more detectors and build a, a telescope that can house a lot of uh, detectors on the focal plane. So in that sense, uh, that's, that's exactly what you see. Uh, we, we went from you know, less than 100 detectors to thousands of detectors to tens of thousands of detectors. Um, all right, so give you an idea of, uh, of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Unfortunately, it, had, it has been uh, 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 decommissioned, is the nice way of saying it. Uh, uh, however, uh, the, the collaboration is still going strong, and we still have all this data that we're analyzing. So I don't think that the telescope, unfortunately, is not with us anymore. Um, so when it was still here, it was uh, uh, at this uh, uh, very high dry spot in the uh, northern mm -hmm. Chile in the Atacama Desert, uh, where you have access to something like 70% of the sky. And we make use of that by mapping something like 40% of the sky. And like I said, it's a, it's a relatively large telescope. Um, and then uh, the Simons Observatory is, uh, is in some sense sort of a successor to ACT, although it, it has a, a wider scope of science. Um, and it, it consists of, uh, of two uh, types of telescopes. One very large one that I already showed you, which is really like a, a better version of ACT. And there's also a set of uh, small telescopes that will go look for this large scale polarization that I was not gonna talk about. Um, so we'll focus mostly on, on the science from that large telescope for you. Um, yeah, the, uh, it's exciting times for, for science observatory. It, uh, it's all coming together now, basically. This is a, uh, in August, um, where this large telescope um, uh, is, is in place. And uh, at the time, the uh, detectors and focal plane essentially was in place as well. Uh, the, the weight was now on the, on the mirrors. Um, a few days ago, uh, the housing has been more complete, but the mirrors are still not there. So that's now what we're waiting for, essentially. Um, the small orbit telescopes, by the way, are already collecting data, and it's very exciting. But again, I, I won't be talking. <laughs> okay. So now uh, I'm going to focus a bit on ACT. Um, so ACT uh, has been observing for quite a long time, um, and uh, along the way, its its focal plane, it, it, the detectors have been upgraded several times. Um, here are some, some details on that, that should not get into, but it observes in several frequencies. Um, but I really want to focus on uh, this last part of it. So basically, the, since 2017. Um, so uh, during this time, ACT observed in five frequency bands, so uh, from 30 uh, gigahertz to 220 gigahertz. Um, and uh, this is the data I've been analyzing today. Uh, we've cut this data down even further by only looking at the three highest frequencies um, just to, to make our lives easier and to, to sort of do one thing at a time. So uh, what we call DR6 is our upcoming data release, and it, it is these three frequencies and it's something like five years of data. Um, to give you an idea of what the data looks like or what kind of patch of the sky we're observing, you can look here, this is a a, a flattened version of the sky. 
um, where you see this, this is roughly this 40% of the sky we observe. You can see the, the galaxy cutting through here. Um, but in a map like this, you don't really see the, the quality of the data. You can then zoom in onto a random part of the sky here of our map, and, and you see something like this. So here at the top is a temperature and a surface, and at the bottom, again, uh, one of the polarization uh, components. And what you see here at the top is, is the cosmic micro the background. That's sort of the, the fuse structure in the back. But if you if you look closely, you see there's a, a, a whole range of, of point sources and uh, other other objects in 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 front of the CMB. But this is showing you that we really have a lot more resolution than perhaps you're used to with cosmic micro observation. Um, and we also have a lot of sensitivity for such. Sticks. What are those? Yeah. yeah, so the red dots are um, are are usually uh, like dusty galaxies, or they're they're something dusty, basically. Uh, the, it could also be uh, well. Let's keep it. Let's see. The blue dots here are are galaxy clusters that, through a different mechanism, actually produce a, a deficit in the temperature. That these would So yeah, focusing on these small scales, um, there are basically three things I want to focus on. So first, just looking at the cosmic microwave background on smaller scales. And really, the thing to learn here, science-wise, is, uh, I think, extensions to the standard model of cosmology, this lambda CDM model that we have, which famously only has six parameters. Um, uh, but you can think of extensions to lambda CDM. One extension would be uh, massive neutrinos. You can think of uh, extra uh, relativistic species in the early universe. Uh, there's a range of, of things you can, you can take off, and having this higher resolution helps a lot with that. So that's, that's one uh, type of science that we're interested in. Um, the second is uh, sort of looking not at the cosmic microwave background, but looking at the sort of uh, um, secondary signal that's present in these maps. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a signal due to galaxy clusters through this effect called the thermal Sonyak Zeldovich effect. And it gives you basically another view of the, of the universe, of the more late time universe, where you see uh, this emission from, uh, from galaxy clusters. So, this is another map we can make with our data. And then finally, this high resolution data allows you to infer uh, something about the, the late time uh, matter distribution in the universe through weak lensing or CMB lens in this case. Um, and, and this is a very powerful probe of, of the late time structure because uh, weak lensing is a very, it's a very simple process really. You don't have to understand a lot about the astrophysics of, of galaxies to, to use it. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that a bit a bit more. So I'll start with um, CMB lensing. Um, all right, so I'm sure you are all familiar with the concept of gravitational lensing. Um, one interesting thing about gravitational lensing is that it's, it's a fact that depends on, on the total uh, mass. So in, in, you know, we're being a cosmologist, there's always uh, sort of the, the normal matter, the what we call baryonic matter and the dark matter. And the problem with lots of uh, sort of optical surveys is that you're you're seeing the baryonic matter, even though you might want to know about the dark matter. But uh, lensing doesn't have this; like it's it's just gravity, so dark matter and, and baryonic matter on the same footing. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, so this this kappa quantity here, which is really the the observable that you hope to. Uh, or the, the, the quantity that you hope to infer, uh, you can think of as, a, as an integral along redshift, along the line of sight um, of just the total matter. So that's this, this over density delta uh, is a total matter. And then there's this kernel W, uh, which tells you what redshifts am I sensitive to. And there it's interesting to compare CMB lensing to uh, galaxy weak lensing. In galaxy weak lensing, you are you are looking at how relatively nearby objects are are moved around. 
And in CMB lensing, you're looking at how the CMB at redshift 1100 is moved, right? So the sort of the source is all the way here. And so your, your kernel here in blue is very wide. So you're basically sensitive to, to all of the matter along the line of sight. And, and so that's different from galaxy lensing where you're, where you're more sensitive to matter, let's say uh, smaller than the redshift one, right? Um, okay, so how, uh, how does this distortion work in slightly more detail? So uh, here's an exaggerated uh, picture where um, there is a large blob of matter here in the middle of the picture, and it, it really distorts the background C and D. And this uh, distortion here is, is really just, you take the uh, unlensed C and B, the primary C and B, and you just remap it. Um, in this case, by this, the gradient of this phi T, again, related to this kappa quantity from the previous slide. Um, and so you could imagine, probably, if you would see this, you could probably infer that there was a lot of matter there at the center. In reality, of course, it's not at this extreme. Um, in reality, we, we um, were looking at arc minute uh, size three mappings, which is quite small uh, with, our, with our resolution. Uh, however, they are coherent over several degrees. There's a 40 by 40 degree patch uh, of, of the primary CMB. And here uh, is the same thing, but now lensed. And it's, it's really hard to see the difference, right? Uh, but if you subtract the two, you will see the difference. Um, I've exaggerated the color scale here by factor five. And now you see sort of the swirly patterns due to this uh, late time structure that's lensing the primary CMB. So the lens that approximate the um, it, it is, uh, well, in what sense do you mean approximation? You mean it's very model dependent? So, so, so your measurement is just this one and you separate them. Yes, you have two separate models. Uh, here, so let me show you this, what I said, perhaps this already answers what you were asking. So ultimately we, we only observe this lens field, right? The field after it's been deflected. It's just this two-dimensional field. And so how we can reconstruct what the inter intermediate matter was that was doing the lensing is by essentially one assumption, which is that the primary CMB emitted that red 1100 was statistically isotropic. So statistically, it's the same wherever you look. Um, and you can imagine if you have a statistically isotropic field, but you now introduce some fixed amount of matter along the line of sight, it's going to introduce a statistical anisotropy because every time this region will be lens like this, right? And so that's by by relying on this assumption of statistical anisotropy, you can infer what the cause of the anisotropy is that you observe. So through that, you can write down an estimator that tells you what this underlying phi field was from this kappa field. Okay. So then, but then there's also other things. That influence the CMB. So all the four, so CID. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, of course, there are some contaminants, and and that's that is something we worry about. Uh, but um, to let's say to first order, this this works very well, and then to second order, we we do correct for these things. Um, yeah. But it, the CMB lensing signal is quite a it's quite a strong signal actually. It's it's even though you think it's it's a higher order perturbation theory, it's it's a, it's almost an order one effect, or the, or it's almost a first order effect. It's it's very strong actually. We observe it now at very high speed. Um, all right. So yeah, through this trick, we can essentially infer what this phi field is that's doing the lensing. Um, so this is what we did. With our with our data, um, and you get these these maps. This is sort of uh, this was our our complete map where we've cut away the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So now it's it's two separate maps, um, and and what you're seeing here is this kappa quantity, which uh, as you remember from previous slide, perhaps was this integrated matter along the line of sight. Question. Yeah. Can you tell anything about what caused 
but it might sell trip fee or oh what yeah so um uh it's going on a tangent. We can talk no, about no, it's okay. Uh, so in this previous slide, right, what cost is NSR to be? Um, it's uh, thinking about it statistically, right? The the um, it's it's a good question because this is kind of a subtle point actually. Um, at the end of the day, we only have one CMB. Right, so a notion about statistical anisotropy always assumes that you think that the CMB is just a realization of a random field, and at that point you can say it's statistically isotropic. Okay, so if you if you imagine you have a different version of the universe, you have different uh, phases, but the correlations are all the same. Um, now imagine that you have a. a Natham structure that's that's the same that's always the same and it's it's always changing these these realizations of the cmb but it's always changing it in the same way right because there is a, a a lot of matter right here and it's always there so that's now there is a preferred spot on the sky so that's an anisotropy if you also want to sort of marginalize over the position of all the matter in the Leitham universe, uh, at that point, actually, everything becomes isotropic again, but it becomes non-Gaussian. This, this footnote here, uh, we're, I might be, might be getting a bit into the weeds, uh, but, uh, but I hope, is it clear that if, if there's some large cluster of galaxies somewhere here, it's always lending stuff here, so you introduced an answer. Thank you. Um, good. Uh, yeah, so we made some maps, and this might just look like noise to you, but it's really quite high sign uh, signal to noise. Um, if you take this rectangle and uh, put it here in, uh, in grayscale and overplot uh, in these contours uh, observations of the cosmic infrared background, which is basically just the distribution of all um, emission from dusty galaxies. Which should correlate very well with the large scale structure, because it is the large scale structure to an extent. And you see indeed that this by eye is a, is a strong correlation. So we are indeed actually uh, seeing the, the late time structure. Okay. Um, now the question is okay, can we do some pathology with this? Uh, what you can do is, is take this map and again take its power spectrum. So, so here now, again, as a function of this multiple, uh, you have a power spectrum of the map. And what I show here is it's not the power spectrum of this map, but it's the prediction from the lambda CDM model uh, conditioned on our observations of the primary CMB. So just the, the Planck data that looked at the, the primary CMB, you get a fit for all of the uh, parameters of the lambda CDM model, and then you can predict what the late time uh, lensing potential uh, uh, power spectrum should be. And then on top of that, you can plot the power spectrum of our map, and it looks like this. So uh, by eye, that looks like it's it's a pretty good fit. It seems like this extrapolation is uh, sensible, but we can we can quantify this a bit better. Um, so you can think a little bit about what is the what parameters of this lambda CM model is actually uh, is are we probing here? And it's it's three parameters at this point, really. It's the the, the amount of matter, so omega m, uh, h naught, the Hubble constant, so that's the, the current rate of expansion, and the sigma eight parameter. And sigma eight is really the 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 leading uh, figure here. It's uh, sigma eight is the you think of as the the amount of of clumpiness today, or if you are a bit more quantitative, it is the um, the RMS of the of the matter perturbations in linear theory today. So it's really just how much clumpiness is there today. Okay, so this is a parameter or derived parameter of the Lambda CDM. Um, uh, from these measurements, this sigma eight parameter, this clumpiness and the amount of matter. Are, are quite degenerate actually. You can't really distinguish them. 
So really what CMB lensing measures is this, what people call S8, this combination of the two. So which, you know, in this cartoon version is just this direction in this parameter space. So you're, you can't really distinguish where you are on these slides, but you can distinguish where you are here. Okay. And so you can, um, just to reiterate our, our idea, right? We have this lambda CDM fit from the very early universe. We can derive what the sigma eight or this S8 parameter would be, and then we can compare it to our direct measurements. Um, so here, is, here are the contours from our measurements. And now we can overplot uh, the prediction from the early universe. And it looks like this. So it's, it seems to be a good fit again. Uh, it's plotted both the um, act and W map contours and the Planck contours, but it doesn't matter in both the degree. These are, are different data sets, but they, they measure the same thing, basically. So this seems to be a good fit. Um, if you care specifically about sigma eight, um, there's this thing you can you can you need to break this degeneracy. And the way to, you, to break this degeneracy is to combine with measurements from the late time universe from the, uh, the so-called uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations in, that you can see in, in galaxy surveys. So if you look at the galaxy surveys, there's sort of a preferred correlation length on the sky. Uh, and and that's, that's a measurement you can do. Um, and if you plot your, your measurement on this same space, the sigma and omega m space of these DAO features, you find that it's completely uh, insensitive to sigma eight, you're just measuring omega m basically. So if you now imagine you combine it with our sort of this banana that we found from CMB lensing, uh, you, uh, you should break this degeneracy. And just here in black, we again have the predictions from the very early years. And again, uh, it matches well. Um, okay. So this was uh, this is an important result. This is the first sort of word for us. An important uh, uh, result for us because it was the first DR6 uh, cosmology result. Um, and it sort of gave us some uh, uh, insight into this, what people refer to as the sigma A tension, which is a bit of an overstatement because it's, it's not really at the level of tension. It's a few sigma discrepancy between the CMB measurements and then um, mostly uh, galaxy weak lensing measurements. So I, I contrasted the two at the very start, right? The CMB lensing and the galaxy lensing. And it turns out they don't really agree on this SA parameter. Um, but it's interesting, at least, that uh, CMB lensing, which probes the late time structure, seems to agree very well with the initial conditions from the scene. Um, and people sometimes you know, frame this tension as a late time, early time tension, but this tells you that it's probably not really the way to think about it. And in fact, we have some later results that really show you that the way to think about it, I think, is to think of um, scales that are linear, in, so basically large scales, and scales that are nonlinear, small scales. And the, the galaxy weak lensing, uh, data is much more sensitive to these nonlinear scales. So at least that's this is now how we try to frame this problem is that it's sort of a nonlinear versus linear problem. Um, yeah, here's just to summarize. Uh, this was the, these were the, the, the three lensing papers that did this result. More recently, we had a, another result where we correlate our lensing maps with uh, galaxy, uh, with galaxies in different redshift bins. And we get um, results that agree essentially. So that's another argument to say it's probably not late time versus early times, but it's linear versus non linear. All right. Um, so that was the CMB lensing. Now I want to, uh, oh, yeah. The X cross on Y is that's non linear and non linear. Well, it, it's it's uh, it's still relatively large scales on the galaxy surface side, so it's quite linear still. At least, definitely compared to the galaxy weak lensing. Yeah. So, before you move on, um, if this map 
of the lensing potential derived on temperature data only or is polarization? Both, both. And we also release uh, ones that are just made from temperature or just from polarization. Because I have the impression that measuring temperature from the ground is a lot harder than in space. That's, that's, that's very true, yeah. Um, there's another thing that makes temperature harder is that everything emits temperature mm -hmm. and not everything emits polarization, right? So all of the galaxies, the thing you mentioned before, like all of the other stuff is also emitting in, in temperature and polarization in many ways is, is very key. Okay. The many things don't emit polarization. Um, yeah, so actually this first thing that you mentioned, like observing temperature from the ground is difficult. That's exactly <laughs> true. You have to look through the atmosphere, right? You're looking at these tiny temperature fluctuations through the, the atmosphere, which is just you know room temperature or whatever. And so it's it's uh, that's that's difficult. And really, what makes it difficult is that you're sort of looking through these turbulent layers of atmosphere. So you get a lot of correlated noise in your detectors. It's not really the detector noise itself, but it's this sort of atmospheric noise that has complicated uh, correlation structures. And that all gets put into your data, and you somehow have to deal with that. And we, we do that by, by doing a very expensive um, map making uh, procedure. So, turning our raw detector data into maps of the sky. Um, we essentially join so, uh, so everything jointly. So, we have like five years of data, and uh, we, we make sure everything can talk to each other. So we can break as many degeneracies between the sky and the atmosphere as possible. Uh, and it works well, but it's incredibly expensive. So really we can do this once or twice, but we cannot make hundreds of simulations of the noise, which is oftentimes something you need to have um, for your cosmological analysis. So one thing we worked on a lot in the last few years was to sort of make a uh, sort of a, an emulated version of of the noise that is very cheap to compute, but is still quite realistic. So it's it's based on the sort of wavelet decomposition of of the noise. Um, I won't go into details, but it's sort of here is just a demonstration to, to show you sort of what it can achieve. You can this is just a simulated version of the of the noise, and you can see that it it captures quite well that there is sort of uh, stripiness to the noise that varies throughout the map. Uh, the correlation length also changed throughout the map. There's lots of sort of complicated features. This is not at all a simple uh, isotropic Gaussian field. Um, so so uh, we've developed this, and this is actually quite a crucial part of this whole analysis. We wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. Um, the other challenge, uh, which is a personal uh, pain of me uh, over the last years, is calibrate the instrument itself. Right, uh, The instruments, like I said, the we're observing both temperature and polarization, um, and we would like to keep them sort of separate. But unfortunately, the telescope itself converts some of the temperature of the sky into uh, fake polarization, just uh, either because there are some uh, elements in the in the optic chain that, that produce some polarization, or it's some sort of mismodeling that we included ourselves that effectively produces polarization. Um, so we spend a lot of time with observations of planets to sort of extract these fake polarization signals. So this is very simple in principle. You just have a, a, a map of a planet, and then you look at your polarization map, and you see some signal, and you, you expect the planet to be unpolarized. So this is all sort of stuff you need to model and subtract. Um, so this was a lot of work. Um, and um, yeah. Some other details about the beams. Uh, this was uh, this was we're getting to the regime where this modeling starts to become more and more. Um, okay, then uh, let's move on to this uh, second effect that I mentioned. Um, this thermal signal effect. So these are another two uh, maps that we've uh, we produced. So. Uh, in case people are not familiar with this, this effect is, is, is relatively simple. It, you can think of it as uh, some CMB photon from the very early universe encounters a galaxy cluster. The galaxy cluster has a lot of free electrons, and some of these electrons essentially upscatter the photon, uh, and it, it scatters it into your telescope. And so what it does 
is it turns the, the CMB spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum of the CMB, which is famously a very good black body, right? It, it sort of upscatters them a little bit. So if you take the difference between what you get and the original black body spectrum, you see this sort of characteristic uh, feature where at frequencies below something like 200, you get a deficit. And above you get you you get a little bit more energy or more temperature in this case. And in practice, what it looks like if you have these three frequencies that we have, and uh, you look at 90 gigahertz, you see some blue dots here. At 150 gigahertz, you see some blue dots, and at 220 gigahertz, they seem to have disappeared. They sort of step through this spectrum, and you can conclude that these were galaxy clusters. And uh, of course, we don't do this by eye, but this is sort of how it works. And, and through that, you can sort of identify where these electrons mm -hmm. are. And you can do this source by source, but what we did for this release was to just do it for each pixel, essentially. And you can create these maps that now just show you, essentially, the integrated electron pressure along the line of sight. So you see all these, these dots here, and those indeed are, are large clusters. But in principle, we're, we're just seeing everything that is consistent with this uh, type of spectrum. Um, here is just to show that uh, people did this for Planck as well. Uh, and, and so Planck here at the bottom and Act here at the top, or Act plus Planck, I should say. And, and you can see that you, you really uh, are leveraging the high resolution now. Uh, so this is one of the things where Act really shines. Um, we spend a lot of time making sure uh, that we're, we have a method that is uh, insensitive to the to our own galaxy because our own galaxy has a lot of bright dust in it that could bias yourself or bias this method. Uh, as you can see here, if you use act plus Planck but use sort of a more simple method, you get these residuals in the map that correlate very well with just maps of dust. Um, but if you use this slightly more advanced method, you seem to be much more sense through that. And you know, this is supposed to be a cosmological signal. So again, it's, you expect it to be statistically isotropic. You don't expect some giant pop up here. So by eye, this, this seems to work well. And we, of course, made this more quantitative. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, this is just the last week we released all of these maps, actually. So if you're interested in it, you can, you have, everything is now online and available. Um, there is a, there's a whole range of cross-correlation analysis uh, ongoing. As you can imagine, we now have two maps, essentially, of the late-time universe. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, data set to correlate with galaxies or other, other traces we have. So there's a lot of effort going on there. OK. Um, cool. And then finally, uh, we talk, I'll talk a little bit about the small scale of the CMB itself. So, um, so then we're talking again about the power spectrum, going back all the way to this first plot where I, wanted, where I said we want to like learn the right side of this plot, um, and, and we're, we're close. We have passed all of our internal tests, um, and we're now unblinding the data. So we're actually now for the first time looking at the data. So it's a sort of exciting and scary time. Um, and really, the, the point is, this is the first time such uh, data uh, or such measurements should really start to improve significantly up this Planck data set. Just to give you an idea of what I mean, um, here's the signal to noise ratio per multiple, so per bin here on the x axis. And then in blue is Planck in polarization. In red is our older ACT data. And then in yellow is now our, this upcoming data set. So we're, we're really, really quite uh, more significant than Planck. So it's, it's quite a big step up. Um, so, yeah, question. Yeah, so what causes the, the, I don't know if you call them resonances across the world? It, it's, it's cosmic variance, basically. So this, this is just, uh, this looks like the power spectrum of the signal you're after. And you know, but we, this is, we only have one universe, so so uh, it's really in sort of the, the peaks of these spectra. There is more signal, but there's also more variance, uh, more sampling variance. So you you should, if you see these sort of wiggles, it means that you're starting to get uh, dominated by by cosmic variance. 
and not so much by your own instrumental notes. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so like I said at the very start, like this, uh, having these small scales and, and having polarization and temperature really allows you to sort of push beyond this lambda CDM model. Um, so here's a, a little forecast we did. Um, we think about an effective parameter which parameterizes the uh, extra unknown uh, relativistic, relativistic species in the early universe that at some point were in thermal equilibrium with the photons and then throws out. Um, this is parameterized by this an effective parameter. I'll get back to that later. Uh, but we're already improving our Planck by by uh, by factor two there. That's that's exciting, and that really comes from the small scales of the power spectrum. Uh, another thing you might have heard about is you know we, there's this Hubble tension in cosmology. One of the um, I don't know, this arguably you can you can differ about this, but an interesting semi-successful model is this early dark energy model. Uh, where you try to uh, add something to the model so that you can uh, make the CMB and the sort of Cepheid uh, calibrated supernova agree. Um, and with our current data here in in uh, in red and blue, you can't really distinguish between uh, a non-zero or a zero value of this FED parameter, which is the the amount of this early dark energy. But uh, if we forecast what we should get with our current data, we get this. This small yellow contour. So really, it it should say if this is a, a viable solution or not. So that's kind of exciting. We'll learn about this in the coming month. Um, and uh, so yeah, that that's act. So it's <laughs> fortunately it's a few months too early for to show you all these <laughs> results. Um, so I'll, I'll end with some more forecasts, but now for the science research. So a little bit further in the future. Um, so going back to this N effective parameter, I, I, I put this in here because I thought perhaps this is more interest to this group here. Um, having the small scale uh, power spectrum measurements uh, gives you a lot of uh, sensitivity to this N effective parameter. So this plot here is somewhat complicated, but let me try to explain it to you. So uh, what you see here on the X axis is the, uh, the temperature of basically the, the photon plasma. Uh, and, uh, and, and effective on the y-axis. And the way to read this now is if I have some um, uh, uh, some particle species, some boson or some fermion, you, you can draw a line on here. And it tells you that uh, if this specific particle froze out at this specific temperature, you should see this ineffective uh, the shift in this ineffective term. And so it's a it's a quite generic way to probe any any relativistic species in the early universe. Um, this region here has already been excluded by Planck, but now with so you can sort of just go down. Um, so so this is kind of an, an interesting way these uh, modern C and B experiments sort of probe the, the particle content of the universe. Um, the other one is, of course, the, the neutrino mass, or the, really I should say, the, the, the sum of the neutrino masses. Um, I explained this a little bit before the talk, but right? uh, the idea is that if the neutrinos have a mass, uh, they, they should cause a suppression of the latent structure formation uh, in comparison with the naive prediction you would have from the early universe. So similar to the lensing story as before, right? we can look at the early universe and predict how much latent structure should there be, and if there's sort of a deviation from that, that could be due to a uh, mass in three months. Um, here's just an illustration of that. So uh, here you have a lot of contrast because there's no neutrino mass in here. It's sort of it's been diffused out. And, and the CMB lensing is, is quite sensitive to that because it's probing this late time structure. And so with SO lensing, this external BAO data set that we mentioned before already, um, we should be able to get to uh, something like 33 uh, milli electron volt, uh, one sigma error bar. And then if you add some external measurement of the optical depth, I've mentioned this before the talk, you can improve this a bit more. Although I have to say this, this will, will take a while to get there. So the first one is probably the one that's more relevant, let's say the common methods. Um, but this is quite exciting. This, this will get you, uh, uh, you know, given that the minimum mass is something like 60, 
this this should uh, this starts really to get in the interesting region where you should start to see the hint of a detection. If you believe not. <laughs> um, all right. And then finally, uh, I want to mention a little bit about primordial non-gaiety. Um, so I will I will put one slide in for for, for some context. Um, so primordial non is the idea that uh, the initial conditions are not quite Gaussian. And actually, in the in the current model, we assume the initial conditions are Gaussian, and we have very good reason to believe that the current data tells that there should be consistent with Gaussian Gaussian initial conditions. Um, but the idea about primordial Gaussianity is that if you if you go even further down and think about something like cosmic inflation, which is supposedly the mechanism that sets up all the correlations in the initial universe, um, if your specific model of inflation has, for example, several fields that can can uh, talk to each other, or you have one field but the field has self interactions, um, you can you can sort of in induce these higher order correlation functions in this initial field, this initial field of curvature perturbations. And those higher order correlation functions then should be translated into higher order correlation functions in the scene. That's in a nutshell what Pramod and Nagasi, the idea of Pramod and Nagasi. So you can measure, try to measure higher order correlation functions here to learn something all the way about inflation. And it's in some sense uh, quite a, uh, ambitious thing because you really are probing enormous energy scales, right? So together with these primordial gravitational waves that I was supposed to talk about, this is really uh, a probe into the extremely high uh, energy scales. So, so that's sort of the, it's a very high risk, high reward type of uh, science, I'd say. Um, right. So um, there are several ways to look for primordial and gas energy. I'll, I'll just talk about the sort of most, um, mature way, which is to look at the bias spectrum, which is really just to look at these three-point functions. So you try to compute what is the three-point function of the sky. So essentially, what is the skewness of, our, of my map? And then relate that to these models of inflation. Um, and, and they're really uh, a focus on the three main models. Which is this local non Gaussian entity, which is the type where you have several fields, and then equilateral and orthogonal, which are two variants of, of a case where you have self interactions. Um, and, uh, and here in, uh, in black are the Planck constraints, which are the best constraints up to now. And then with the SO, we will get, or Planck and SO will get to these red constraints, which you know, might, might get you in a regime where you start to see something if there's something bad. So that, that I think is exciting. Um, if if there are any, yeah, right. it's, yeah. Could you explain what you mean with self interaction of the field? It's like a mass term, or no, like yeah. some uh, some uh, field cubed or or term. And in, in general, it can be quite generic. I would say really the the most clear cut thing is this local model. It's really because it's it's extremely difficult to get these types of correlations in there if you just have a single field. But the way to think about it, if if we ever observe local non Gaussianity, there must have been several fields. Um, if you if you see some of these, you sort of are learning about the fields, uh, field content perhaps, uh, or the yeah uh, the interactions. That you, um, but it's perhaps a bit more model dependent. This is this is really. Uh, that the most straightforward one. The oftentimes people only talk about local induction. Um, yeah, there are there are also other ways to specifically go up to local non Um, but I would argue that this way is the most robust way and the most mature way. So we will get there are results here will be really the benchmark for any future results. Um, and we're getting really to the point where uh, these will be very close to the best measurements we will get on equilateral and orthogonal. So we're just running out of modes to measure essentially. So in that sense, SO will, will get pretty close to the final measurements to see whether we will ever know if it's here or not. Um, so, so that's why, it. Why do you say character service best company? Sorry, what did I say? Why do you say that character service best company? For equilateral and orthogonal, I think they, they are less uh, competitive because 
you, you cannot use this um, scale dependent bias uh, method that is used for local non Gaussian entity. And so you really have to deal with um, all of the uh, secondary non Gaussian entity, which is quite degenerate with the equilateral and orthogonal shapes. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of the frustrating thing. The information is there. There's clearly more information in the large scale structure, but extracting it in a robust way um, might take a, a few decades for equilateral and orthogonal, I think. For local, we might be close. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I was gonna go off some chance, but I'm, I'm running out of time, I think. Um, this is something I, I work very actively on and we're preparing for SO. And the interesting thing is with ACT, we, we have a nice test bed. So we're also releasing some, some early results on these with ACT very soon. Um, okay, I think that was it. My summary, uh, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go over it. The lensing, our first result, the lensing measurements were exciting for us because it shows you that this extrapolation from the early universe seems to work well. Uh, we have released this data just now, so that's also exciting for us. And we're very close to getting the power spectrum analysis done, uh, which really should should be uh, an interesting cosmological data set. And then uh, Simon's Observatory is, is underway. Uh, Max is analyzing the data as we speak. And uh, <laughs> we should uh, see results coming out. Uh, also, we don't have to wait five years, so the intermediate results as well. So it's an exciting time for us to make as much. That's it. Thank you. And Sadri, uh, we have a few minutes for questions if there are any more. Yeah, you can start. I have a quick one. So, uh, do we go to 42? So, I want you to keep in mind that I am, this is now my field uh, when I ask this, but I guess I was very, so this one, maybe 401 is when you're showing the, that one. Um, how easy is it for you to just aggregate blank enact data? Because one is a satellite, the other one's ground based. And at least from when I was in in any collaboration that I've been, whenever we try to aggregate results from a different experiments, it's a nightmare and it's not very yeah, easy. yeah. No, it, it's definitely not a trivial task. You really have to model the, the both experiments. Mm -hmm. um, Quite, quite well, yeah. What was the, was it the, I guess, were there, they just, I don't know, I, I was just read so well, but I guess I wasn't, maybe you're just not, uh, the modeling is not so, I, I was just surprised at how well they ended up. Oh, working. well, yeah, I mean, you have to believe me that it works well, but it's, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, one thing that's very tricky, for example, is that we have these frequency bands, but they're really not, not 90 gigahertz, where we're looking at a very wide range of, of frequencies. And both experiments have a 90 gigahertz band, but they don't agree, actually. So a lot of effort went into modeling to sort of uh, the, the frequency dependence of the, of the instrument. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, no, it's we make a lot of sims where we sort of try to vary these uncertain things. So you, someone can sort of marginalize over them. But it's, it's true, this is a challenge. The sky is the same, so they should agree. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, true, yeah. but then we look at neutrino oscillations and then the physics is the same, but yeah. then you look at what Ice Cube publishes versus what uh, Nova and P2K publish, and then they have uh, uh, tension, or there had been tension at the time. And then you're like, well, it's the same physics. And then they go and, ah, oh, but the, the, the kinematics are different, the experiments are different. and then, so I guess that's where I'm surprised there wasn't more story to this, but it's 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 very nice. Anyway, like I said, different feeling. Well, we're near this. Yeah. Uh, go back one slide, please. This very type of display. Uh, 41, yeah. So is there something magic about 220 gigahertz where this turns over? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, that's a, but it, it is sort of, it's 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 all it's um uh it is always the 
Yeah. Um, it, it has to do it has to do with the fact that you're that it's relative to the C and D black body. If you have a different temperature of the C and D black body, it will be at a different frequency. Yeah. But it's it's that and the sort of the physics of of complex scattering that tells you that it should be there. I mean, it's yeah, there are higher order corrections. We are assuming that this is a non-relativistic uh, philosophy distribution. If it becomes relativistic, which is it's to to an extent true, you know, you shift this, this thing around a little bit. Okay. We we're getting to the point where we can detect this, but uh the average is is yeah, is like that. So if you go beyond 220 gigahertz, do you see it? Yeah, you start to see a red. Yeah, so it's that's also why we combined with the Planck satellite. The Planck satellite has several frequencies that are that go that are higher than ours. So it is important to combine the plum gives you more extra leverage. Uh yeah we're over time on oh, okay. <laughs> no I'll talk to you. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's take a little time.